is the zoom on akil zoom is on now we are live how many have joined can you put on the screen so that we can see okay um, let's uh, start the session uh, good afternoon i am dr vinnya ariratna i am the president of the sri lanka medical association and we are starting uh, the uh, monthly clinical meetings uh, for the year 2020 uh, with um, a clinical meeting in collaboration with the anatomical society of sri lanka and it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, our three resource persons for this particular clinical meeting uh, firstly i would like to very warmly welcome on behalf of the sri lanka medical association professor madhuanti disanayaka who is the professor and consultant eye surgeon of the department of anatomy uh, and genetics and biomedical informatics uh, faculty of colombo um, faculty of medicine university of colombo then we also have uh, from the department of uh, anatomy of the faculty of medical sciences university of sri jayawardenepura and also the honorary secretary of sl nemi dr sajit edri singh and i uh, also would like to welcome sajit also very warmly to this uh, clinical uh, meeting then we have dr sitara disanayak uh, who is the consultant ent surgeon uh, who is also a senior lecturer in anatomy uh, at the faculty of medical sciences Uh, university of sri jayawardenepura so the topic for uh, today uh, and we are going to have uh, three three topics but uh, i would actually not go into uh, explaining and uh, uh, welcoming each of the uh, uh, introducing the three, three uh, speakers and topic uh, myself i would like to invite dr achala balasurya uh, who is our uh, vice president one of the two vice presidents of sri lanka medical association who will uh, chair this session and uh, invite our uh, experts to uh, present their make their presentations at this clinical meeting i'd like to also welcome all of you who are joining online and who are also uh, physically present uh, here uh, at the clinical meeting so uh, may i invite uh, dr achala balasurya who is a consultant physician Uh, working at uh, hema hospitals uh, to uh, chair this session and uh, moderate the session uh, uh, until the end of the uh, clinical meeting thank you Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first clinical meeting of the Sri Lankan Association, Sri Lanka Medical Association. And today we uh, plan to conduct the meeting in collaboration with the Anatomical Society of Sri Lanka. So we have three eminent speakers. The first speaker is Dr. Sitara Disanayaka, MBBS MD, uh, DCHNS UK, consultant eye surgeon, senior lecturer in anatomy. Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Jayawardenepura. She will be talking to us on anatomical basis for evaluation of common neck problem. Over to you, Dr. Sitara Disanayake. Thank you, Dr.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bansuri. Uh, it's an absolute honor to be here uh, and to present how you can incorporate your anatomy knowledge in evaluating a neck problem. And because of the time factor, I'll be only dealing with the neck lumps today. So let's look at a, uh, the first patient. Now, before I start, I must say that I uh, declare no rights for any of these images the, uh, as they were taken from the internet. The, the credit should go to the original authors. Uh, the first scenario, a common scenario, let's say you are in the OPD and you see a middle-aged woman, woman coming and complaining about anterior neck lump, gradually enlarging in size for a few months. And this is not causing any problem apart from the cosmetic appearance. A second patient, let's say a 67 year old male, a diabetic coming with a painful lump behind the ear for one week's duration. The lump is gradually enlarging and it's painful for the patient. A third patient, again, a 55 year old male coming with a gradually enlarging lump behind the angle of the mandible for about one month's duration. And the fourth patient, another patient, incidentally uh, noticed a lump, but now during the past few weeks, it's gradually enlarging. So irrespective of the history, all these patients are presenting with a neck lump. So by all means, the first would be to obtain a very detailed history and then the examination. So what is, where is the neck? Basically, neck is anteriorly from the lower part of the mandible to the upper part of the sternum and posteriorly from the external occipital protuberance to the spinous process of C7. Now the neck is covered by the skin, but there's very important surface anatomy that you can uh, observe or palpate uh, in the neck. To name your sternocleidomastoid muscles, you can see the sternocleidomastoid muscle then you can see the you can feel the hyoid bone the thyroid cartilage especially the notch will be clearly visible in males then below the thyroid cartilage another prominence which is the cricoid cartilage and the trachea also you will be able to feel and little posterior you will be able to feel the trapezius now this surface anatomy is very very important for you to Proceed. Again, to show what you will see outside is just the skin covering the neck, but you can palpate definitely very important landmarks. These are important because when you are describing or when you are arriving at a diagnosis of a neck lump, you have to know the exact location of it. So to tell the location, these landmarks are going to be important. Now, I said the neck is covered by the skin. And then you have the subcutaneous tissue. Underneath the subcutaneous tissue, you have the superficial plate uh, fascia. And there's an the important muscle, there, which is your platysma muscle. So any superficial lump attached to the skin or just underneath the skin, irrespective of the location, I would first discuss. So this, so this plane is also very important feature that you need to know when you are examining a patient with a neck lump. Let's take this lump. A well-defined lump, soft, let's say, uh, fluctuant but not transillumable 
and maybe there is a punctum as well. So when this happened, so you have ascertained the anatomical plane, you know that this is a superficial lump attached to the skin, there's a punctum. If you know your cross-section of the skin, I think it's very easy for you to diagnose this as a sebaceous cyst. Of course, you have to look at the rest of the clinical picture also. Then another child, let's say. Again, a cyst, cystic lump, well-defined, uh, fluctuant, but not transilluminable. And maybe when you examine, there might be a small bony defect underneath also. So then, even though this is a superficial lump, this is a dermoid cyst. And the problem with the dermoid cyst is that they appear where there are lines of fusion. And the other thing is they can communicate with interior. So in the hedonic region, you must think about the dermoid cysts also. And another, another lump on the back of the neck. Again, uh, skin can be picked up, a superficial lump, uh, fluctuant, transilluminable. And when you feel the edges, the slipping sign is possible. So then you know this is a lump arising from the subcutaneous tissue, like a lipoma. So now we'll go to the deeper structures. So deeper to the platysma, you have the deep cervical fascia. And in the neck, deep cervical fascia are divided into investing layer. Then you have the pretracheal layer, prevertebral layer, and the carotid sheath. The investing layer, the investing layer is the one that you can see that which had been cut on the other side. So the investing layer is like a collar and they split to enclose the trapezius as well as the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So here onwards, any lump appearing, we will be describing in relation to these structures. So, if you take the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the anterior midline, the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, as well as the lower border of the mandible, forms a triangle. And that triangle is the anterior triangle. So that is the anterior triangle. And the triangle behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle in front of the trapezius and the middle one third of the clavicle, that becomes your posterior triangle. Again, now these triangles can be divided into further triangles so that depending on the content, you can arrive at a diagnosis or a differential diagnosis of a particular lump. So that is the anterior triangle. So any lump in this region, anterior to the sternocleidomastoid, broadly you can say it's an anterior triangle lump. So that's the posterior triangle. Then the anterior triangle gets subdivided again, because it's easier for us to work out the differential diagnosis. There's a submental triangle, submandibular triangle, submental, submental triangle, submandibular triangle, carotid triangle, and the muscular triangle. So let's look at each one of these triangles in terms of their boundaries and contents, because any lump arising in that triangle would be probably a content in that triangle. So the submental triangle, the arbitrary midline, you have the hyoid bone, and then the anterior belly of digestion. So that's the submental triangle. And the important content in that 
would be the submental lymph nodes. So if a patient comes and it's a lump in the submental triangle, the first thing that comes to your mind should be whether this is a lymph node, right? By the way, this is, if they are deeper to the uh, skin, right? Deeper structures, which I have mentioned before. So when it is the submental lymph node, again, when you know your anatomy, you can uh, recall that the submental triangle drains a wedge-shaped area coming from the tip of the tongue, the central part, as well as the flow of the mouth and the, including the four incisors. So if there's a problem in those areas, and there's a lymph node, you can clinically plan out the rest of the management. Then the submandibular tract, which is bounded by the anterior belly of diagastric and the posterior belly of diagastric together with the lower border of the mandible. Now, the content, the important content is there are multiple contents. However, the important content would be your submandibular gland as well as your submandibular lymph node. So then when a patient comes with a lump and you, you, uh, you know that this is in the submandibular triangle, you have to think, is it a submandibular gland or is it a submandibular lymph node? Then, how are you going to use your anatomy knowledge and differentiate the two? Well, of course, you can see the submandibular gland here. So that is the superficial part. This is the deep part. And this muscle is the myelohyoid muscle. So if we put the finger inside from outside and sort of feel the flow of the mouth, and then bring another finger and keep it outside, what we call as the bimanual palpation. If it is arising from the submandibular gland, we should be able to feel it because that is the myelohyoid muscle. This is the superficial part and who surround it, that is the deep part. So you can easily palpate that if it is arising from the submandibular gland. Of course, if it is a submandibular lymph node, then it may not be bimanually palpable. Now you can see the lymph nodes are superficial to the submandibular gland. So there are other contents also in the submandibular triangle like the facial artery, the facial vein. Um, but when we are looking at a lump, those structures giving out to a lump clinically would be rare. And again, because it's a lump, there's another important structure there anatomically, the marginal mandibule. If someone is planning to take the submandibular gland out, the incision has to place to preserve the marginal branch of the facial, marginal mandibular nerve of the facial nerve. So again, that's an anatomical importance. Then deeper to the myelohyoid, what do you have? So this, to this part, the deep part of the gland would be related. So therefore, again, in surgery, maybe when you are taking the consent, you know that these things has to be mentioned. The lingual nerve, the proximity to the gland, and then the hypoglossal nerve. Let me show them. So that is the lingual nerve, which is related to the duct also. So should be careful when ligating the duct. And then that would be the hypoglossal nerve. So the anatomy of the neck is quite important, not just for the diagnosis, but as well as for planning the treatment. Then when we come to the carotid triangle, it is bounded by the posterior belly of diagastric, the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the superior belly of omohyoid. And deeper you have the 
constrictors of the pharynx, the middle and the inferior, as well as the hyoglossus and the thyrohyoid membrane. So what are the contents? So the contents would be your common carotid bifurcating into the internal and external. Then you have the internal jugular vein. You have multiple nerves. One of the important nerves within the carotid sheet would be your vagus. And then you have the lymph nodes also. Clinically, we can say level two, three, uh, and part of the four lymph nodes as well. So any lump in the carotid triangle, you have to think of these structures. Let's say this patient uh, in his, let's say, 30s and coming with a gradually enlarging lump. And when you examine, it's a well-defined lump, maybe firm to firm in consistency and uh, fluctuant, but may not be transcendable. So then you have to think of the structures in the carotid and not just the structures in the carotid triangle, but also you have to remember your embryology. Because embryologically, you have the pharyngeal arches. And outside, you have the uh, pharyngeal clefts. Inside, you have the pharyngeal pouches. And the second arch goes on to cover the third, fourth, and joins the fifth to make the smooth contour outside. So if there's anything retained within, that could lead to a cyst, a fistula, or a sinus. And that is a branchial cyst, fistula, or a sinus. So smooth, fluctuant, non-tender, non-transiluminable, mobile lump. Think about the branchial cleft cysts also. And usually they are related to the uh, anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Another patient. A similar, sort of a slow growing, painless lump. Maybe sometimes, maybe pulsatile also. Side to side movement is possible, but not otherwise. And when you do an imaging, there can be splaying of the carotid arteries. So this is a picture of a carotid body tube. So again, carotid triangle, think about the structure within, which is the carotid body. So it comes from the chemoreceptors of the carotid artery. Lymph nodes. Again, uh, probably more commoner than the carotid, not probably, definitely more commoner than the carotid body and the other uh, pathologies that I talked about. So if it is acute lymphadenitis, you would expect the features of acute inflammation. The chronic lymphadenitis, again, the history and examination will help you. And then, of course, you have to think of the, um, the malignancies, maybe in the lymphoma, maybe in the lymph nodes alone, or maybe it's a metastatic lymph node. It doesn't matter about the pathologies, but um, you should be able to, especially if it is a carotid triangle lump, always think of the lymph nodes. And if it is, because that is the more common, and if it is a lymph node, think about all possibilities relating to the history. Is it an acute enlargement? Is it a chronic enlargement? Could it be a lymphoma? Could it be a metastatic lymph node? So therefore, your rest of the examination, if it is suggestive of an isolated lymph node, then the rest of the examination, you have to examine all lymph node groups. Then if it is a metastatic lymph node, suggestive of a metastasis, you have to look at all primary sites. So then comes to the muscular triangle or the anterior triangle, uh, which is bounded by the superior belly of formaldehyde. 
superior belly of formaldehyde, the anterior, belly, anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid, and the arbitrary midline. The important, the most important lump that comes in the anterior triangle would be your thyroid lumps because the thyroid gland is in the anterior muscular triangle, thyroid as well as the parathyroid. As you should not forget, the thyroglossal duct cyst. So if you remember your embryology, you know that it comes as a out pocket from the foramen cecum uh, between the junction between anterior two third and the posterior one third. And then it descends um, in front of the hyoid, sometimes hooks around the hyoid to the anterior trunk. And because it's coming from the tongue, when you fix the mandible and ask the patient to put the tongue out, the lump moves up and down. So therefore, that is again an instance where your anatomy knowledge is going to be helpful. Uh, coming onto the posterior triangle, it is bounded by the anterior border of the trapezius, posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the clavicle. So again, another lump like this in the first picture looks like in the apex of the posterior triangle and the structures, I mean, deeper you have the muscles and there are vessels as well as the nerves, but the most important common one would be the lymph node. Again, this is another lymph node mass that is going to the anterior as well as the posterior triangle. We should not forget the supraclavicular lymph node, especially on the left side. So the left posterior, now that's the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So that's the trapezius, it's swing slightly little wasted. So here you get a lymph node in the supraclavicular fossa, which is the virtuous node. So you shouldn't forget that also. Then pharyngeal pouch, another lump that can come in the posterior triangle. So in any patient, first I would say, please look at the location Look at the surface anatomy, see which triangle it belongs to, and then try to identify the plane. When you identify the plane, then you can definitely arise, arrive at a diagnosis or even at a differential diagnosis so that you can investigate in that line without jumping into investigations, uh, without examining the patient. So in children, I would like to mention the congenital cystic hydromas also. Sometimes, uh, so then you have to look at the flow of the mouth also. Then remember this hemangiomas also in children. Um, that's all that I'll be talking about. But in summary, what I need to say in terms of anatomy and neck lumps, it's very important that you know your neck anatomy to arrive at a diagnosis, a differential diagnosis, so that you can plan out the management. And please stick to your basics, know your triangles, look at the contents, look at the planes, and uh, clinically try to identify which plane it belongs to, which triangle it belongs to, and what are the structures in that. And then you can do a better, uh, better job diagnosing the patient rather than jumping into investigations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sitara Dusanayaka for that very illustrative uh, presentation. And now uh, it's time for questions. There is one question coming from, actually it's a request coming from the audience. Uh, there is Dr. Saranga Balagela is asking you to, uh, Describe red flags when evaluating neck lumps. Yes, uh, red, that's a very good question. Now, red flags, it comes from the history also, not just from the examination. So when you take about the history, uh, sort of quickly progressing lumps, 
and then symptoms such as retractable, autalgia, dysphagia, change in voice, like associated symptoms like that. These can be red flags, associated constitutional symptoms like loss of appetite, loss of weight, and um, any nerve palsy on examination, if there are any nerve palsies, these could be red flag symptoms and signs. And on examination, hard inconsistency, edges are ill-defined and um, sort of attached to the nearby structures and uh, maybe uh, engorgement of the vessels, maybe above that then vessels are engorged, associated cranial nerve palsies. Uh, so these would be red flags, symptoms and signs uh, when you're evaluating the lab. You can type in your questions, one or two can be accommodated. And also when you talk about hemangiomas, if there's a hemangioma somewhere, always think that there can be hemangiomas elsewhere, also, especially in children. So if you're trying to anesthetize the patient, please be aware of the possibility of a subglottic hematoma. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, which makes it difficult to resect also. Yes, yes, sir. I have not gone into uh, management or uh, investigation part because we are relating the anatomy to examination. Um, if there are any questions. So in the absence of further questions, I would again like to thank Dr. Sitara Bisanoid for that very illustrative uh, presentation. Our next speaker uh, is Professor Madhuvanti Bisanayaka, MBBS MD, Professor and Consultant Eye Surgeon, Department of Anatomy, Genetics and Biomedical Informatics, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. She would be talking on Applied Anatomy of the Eye and Ovid. Over to you, Dr. Professor Madhuvanti Bisanayaka. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Balasuria, for the uh, introduction. At the outset, I would like to thank the Sri Lanka Medical Association uh, for inviting the uh, Anatomical Society of Sri Lanka uh, to give this uh, uh, presentation. And I'm uh, very much honored to be here uh, to discuss applied anatomy of the eye and orbit. So uh, I would be in my presentation taking you through the applied anatomy. Um, around the anatomy of bony orbit, eyeball, and the eyelid. And uh, I would be uh, taking uh, some case examples. And uh, uh, I have to also declare that the images I have taken are from the internet and uh, the uh, ownership is uh, with the original authors. So let's take the uh, first case. Uh, it is a case. Uh, a patient, a 15-year-old boy, sustained an injury to the left side of his face with a tennis ball while playing. And uh, the uh, patient had, uh, the ball had uh, directly hit the uh, left eye and there was a periorbital edema, redness and pain in and around the eye. And on examination, uh, he had double vision on looking up. So as in this uh, picture, uh, this is a typical presentation where you would be uh, encountering in your day-to-day -day practice. So
So anatomical basis uh, of this uh, condition, we would like to see the uh, anatomy of the bony orbit. So considering the anatomy of the bony orbit, uh, now you can uh, see that the bony orbit uh, is composed of seven bones. So this bony orbit has a, it's a pyramidal shaped structure and it has four walls. The roof is here formed by the, the frontal bone as well as the, the lesser wing of the sphenoid. And this part is the lateral wall formed by the greater wing of sphenoid here and the zygomatic bone. And you can see that the lateral wall is between the superior orbital fissure and the inferior orbital fissure. The inferior wall or the flow of the orbit is formed by the zygomatic bone and the maxillary bone and with a small piece of the uh, palatine bone. And when you uh, look at the medial wall, the medial wall here is formed by the sphenoid bone, the body of the sphenoid, then the ethmoid bone, lacrimal bone, and the maxillary bone. So what is a blowout fracture? When these bony landmarks are guarding uh, this bony socket, if there is any uh, impact, which is of equal or greater size, greater diameter than the orbital aperture, the bony socket is unable to sustain that pressure. So that causes a blowout in this limited space. So what will happen? It will result in a fracture of one of the orbital walls. So usually it is the orbital flow or the medial wall. So why does it happen in the medial wall and the inferior wall or the flow? Because those two walls are the weakest. The reason being uh, the ethmoid bone here, as we know, is the, this part is the lamina papyracea a paper thin part of the bone, which you will see is very thin in your anatomical days. You would remember that in some of the skulls, you don't even find that it's so thin. And the other reason is it is related to the ethmoid sinus. So there is no support medially. Same way, the flow of the orbit, the orbital plate of the maxillary bone is the superior boundary of the maxillary sinus that is also thin as well as there is no other structure to support the wall. So therefore these two walls are the weakest of the bony orbit and therefore the fractures of the uh, fractures are most commonly seen in the inferior and the medial walls. So let's go back to our patient. So in a patient, when you get a patient uh, who comes, who comes with uh, a blowout fracture, how, what should be your approach? as in any patient uh, who is coming after trauma, it should be ABC. Right, so uh, remember ABC first, and then you would do your specific examination. So always remember that the examination of the eye is very important because Every patient should have the other concomitant ocular trauma ruled out. Otherwise, the patient will lose vision even if the rest of the uh, trauma is um, adequately handled. 
So what are the things that you should do? Anatomically, the integrity of the globe uh, is shown in this functional evaluation of vision. So visual acuity is important to check the uh, integrity of the globe as well as the optic nerve function. Then you should also look for any chemosis or conjunctival injection or subconjunctival hemorrhage because it can hide a scleral laceration. Also, sometimes if the facilities are available, slit lamp examination with fluorescein can uh, give, a, uh, give important uh, uh, information regarding any corneal lacerations. If the fluorescein is shown to leak, uh, then you know that there is a, a breakage in the cornea. Also, if there is iris damage, then you can look at the pupillary shape. If the pupil is uh, round, and if there, are, if there are no irregularities, uh, then you can be satisfied to a certain degree. But if the pupil is teardrop shape, then you should always suspect a damage further along the iris, or if there is iris prolapse, then the pupil will change its shape to a teardrop pupil. Also look at the anterior chamber. Are there any uh, fluid levels? Is there any reddish color blood in the um, anterior chamber? High femur should be carefully looked into. Sometimes you can only see a tiny fluid level. Also look at the uh, eye from an external point of view. If there is enough thalamus, then it can tell you that there is uh, tissue da damage and uh, that can precede the tissue edema. Also, if there is a hematoma inside, that can cause a proptosis. Another uh, feature that is important to evaluate is the ocular movements in this patient. As you know, the extraocular muscles, again, seven. So the rule of seven, Again, seven extraocular muscles, the four recti, and the two oblique muscles, and the levator palpebri superioris. Out of those, as you know, what is related to the flow of the orbit would be the inferior oblique, which arises from the medial aspect of the flow of the orbit from the maxillary bone here, as well as the inferior rectus, which will be originating from the annulus uh, of ring here, but would be anteriorly uh, extending. And at this point, both these would be um, covered by a common fascial sling. So therefore, if there is any damage in the inferior orbital wall or the flow of the orbit, the whole thing can get entangled into the uh, the orbital flow fracture. So there are different types of orbital flow fractures. Uh, in some, there can be a trapdoor fracture where the fracture end could be impinging on the soft tissue and that would cause restriction of the uh, movements of the eye. So as shown in this diagram, when the patient is asked to look up, there is limitation of up gaze in the affected eye. Another important thing that you should remember is the ocular cardiac reflex. The extraocular muscles have stretch receptors, which are supplied by the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve, and they are in uh, connection with the brain stem centers and with the vagus nerve. So the bradycardia, nausea, and even syncope can occur if the extraocular muscles are overly stretched. Another important thing is if there is a, a retrobulbar hemangioma, 
then that can compress the optic nerve, which will lead to uh, optic nerve dysfunction and loss of vision, which will not be correctable. So it's important to monitor the patients who are having hematomas, uh, retrobulbar hematomas, and sometimes if the hematoma is enlarging, then the lateral uh, cantholysis is a procedure done in the emergency room to relieve the pressure that uh, will be affecting the optic nerve. So further examination in this patient would include palpation of the orbital rim. So speci speci uh, specifically the inferior uh, orbital rim here, uh, you have to feel for any step offs. Also another feature that you should remember is to check the periorbital um, sensation. As you know, anatomically, the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve courses through the infraorbital canal and then it comes out through the infraorbital foramen and that will supply the cheek area here. So if there is any, uh, in, uh, any numbness or paresthesia in this region, uh, including the cheek and the upper teeth and this area, so you should uh, be more careful about checking for a fracture in the orbital flow. Also, if the fracture involves the medial wall, then as you know, the uh, ethmoidal air sinus can get damaged. And especially if there is nose blowing, air can get trapped inside and you would be able to feel crepitus. And the patient should be uh, requested not to uh, blow the nose uh, and uh, you should uh, take, that, take that into consideration. So this uh, picture shows the ocular movements that would be difficult in a patient who would be having a flow of the orbit fracture. So here in this patient, you would see the up gaze movement is very much limited. So in a patient like this, what are the investigations that you should do? The imaging investigations should be the gold standard is uh, the CT scan because not only the uh, flow of the orbit fracture, but also hematoma and entrapment can be seen. And the typical feature is the teardrop sign. However, if the facilities are not available, then a sinus weave or the water's weave skull x-ray would be important. That will also show this teardrop sign, as well as sometimes if there is a fluid level, if there is bleeding, or if there is a fluid level in the maxillary sinus, that could also be seen with the uh, skull x-ray. So why is it important to uh, check this? Uh, all this is very important because if this condition is not uh, um, treated promptly, the fibrous tissue will proliferate and there will be fibrosis, which will make the patient uh, miserable for the whole of his life because of diplopia. So within uh, one to two weeks, this condition should be identified and referred for further treatment. So it's very important to assess this condition. So the anatomical basis of this will uh, tell you why uh, all these uh, features are there. So with that, we will move on to the next case. So the next case, uh, I will uh, go very briefly. Uh, so it's a patient with uh, a 65-year-old man presenting to the clinic with drooping of his right eyelid. So what is the anatomical basis for a differential diagnosis? So to uh, address that, we want to know the anatomy of the eyelid. So just looking at the cross-section of the eyelid. So what are the components in this eyelid cross-section? As you know, uh, this is the cornea and this is the conjunctiva. So it's going into this superior phonics. 
and this is the upper lid and the upper lid is covered by conjunctiva here and this is the uh, the mucocutaneous junction the outer part here is the skin so as you know the skin will have its normal structures the uh, the sebaceous glands and sweat glands and the this special feature here is the eyelashes and the eyelashes will have its own uh, associated glands the glands of moll and glands of says which are sebaceous glands here there is another uh, important gland in the uh, just under the uh, conjunctiva in the lid so that is the meibomian gland so this meibomian gland is usually the cause of uh, styes that would be appearing in most of the patients so inflammation and blockage of this meibomian glands will give rise to the sty uh, so if a patient comes with um, ptosis this also could be a reason so it will be appearing like this so you have to look at the local uh, tissue here so there is inflammation so gland of says inflammation and infection uh, can occur as well as uh, because of the the uh, skin and loose areolar tissue here any uh, other inflammation or allergy can cause periorbital edema involving the eye uh, lids uh, then let's see what else is there in this eyelid so anatomically what other structures are there we have the two muscles one muscle is for the eyelid elevation so that is the levator palpebri superioris this one and the other one is for closure of the eye the orbicularis oculi muscle which is supplied by the facial so this is the levator palpebri superioris muscle which is supplied by the ocular motor nerve apart from that there is another component that is attached to the uh, levator palpebri superioris this small muscle or what is called the tarsal muscle is also named as the muller's muscle that muscle is supplied by the autonomic nervous system the sympathetic nerves so uh, let's see uh, what other causes anatomically can cause this ptosis so between the nerve and the muscle as you know the neuromuscular junction so another cause of this ptosis can be the uh, as you know the myasthenia gravis the special feature here is it can be bilateral but it will be asymmetrical and it's not constant it can be varying it may be more in the towards the afternoon and you can test it with different tests including the ice pack test which with uh, which will improve with resting of the uh, muscle function then as we go on uh, let's talk about the other nerves that are involved so what is this here if you look at this patient what do you think yes there is slight ptosis or partial ptosis and if you look at the pupils they are not equal so here the pupil is constricted so what is the diagnosis yes horner syndrome so that means the uh, the muller's muscle is involved and that is due to the sympathetic pathway so wherever uh, along the pathway uh, it may have been affected so you can uh, get your anatomy and um, working on that you can find out where the problem is okay going back another patient with ptosis so this time it's a complete ptosis so in this patient what is the likely diagnosis yes as we were discussing the anatomical uh, causes it is the ocular motor nerve so ocular motor nerve the origins in the midbrain at the level of the superior colliculus and then comes along the interpeduncular fossa and then through the cavernous sinus and then enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure so during its course it can get affected anywhere so 
the important thing is if you see the uh, ptosis, if you see ptosis, always lift the lid up and look for the pupillary um, size because of this anatomical fact. So when you take the third nerve palsy, it can be surgical or medical as you know. The surgical third nerve is due to the external compression of the, uh, the ocular motor nerve. And why should it get affected? Because the parasympathetic fibers, which uh, origin in the Edinger westphal nucleus lie on the periphery of the nerve. So therefore, any compressive lesion, a tumor, aneurysm, or hemorrhage can uh, readily involve the pupil. Whereas the uh, small blood vessels inside will be affected in, medi in, in medical reasons such as diabetes and um, hypertension. So this is the reason for the uh, medical and the surgical uh, compression, um, surgical third nerve palsy. So you have to always check for the pupillary size. And here you can see a common example of this um, um, third nerve palsy due to a surgical cause that is the posterior communicating artery aneurysm. So uh, unless you check for that, the patient coming to you with the ptosis will uh, have to pay uh, for his life. So it is very important to check for the pupil if you uh, want to assess the ptosis patient. So with that, uh, I think I have within the given time, uh, I have tried to give a basic uh, understanding of the uh, anatomy of the eye orbit and the uh, lid uh, to come to some uh, conclusions in uh, coming to a differential diagnosis. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Professor Madhuvanti Disanayaka for that detailed and interesting talk on applied anatomy of the eye and orbit. Now the session is open for questions. Levator palpi pre superior is, is it classified as a skeletal muscle? Or, yes, sir. or it is classified as skeletal muscle, yes. but with a sympathetic supply. Uh, sir, actually, the levator palpi pre superior is, is a skeletal muscle which is supplied by the ocular motor nerve, but there is a, a separate muscle which is the Muller muscle, which is right. that muscle is the one that is supplied by the sympathetic uh, nerves. So that is also skeletal. Uh, that that is uh, the Muller's muscle. Yeah, that's the, that is uh, the autonomic. Uh, that yeah. is supplied by the autonomic component. So even though it is skeletal, it has an autonomic component. Uh, yes, that's right. So that's why you get the re uh, retraction in thyrotoxicosis. Yes, that is not very well explained, but that is one of the postulations uh, why you get the, uh, the sympathetic Retrac symptoms. Yeah. Right. Thank you. In the absence of any further questions, may I now call upon uh, our third speaker, Dr. Sajid Tedri Singha, MBBS, MSc in Clinical Genetics, MSc Health Administration, PhD in Anatomy, Uni University of Sri Jayavadanapura, Senior Lecturer and Clinical Genetics, Department of Anatomy, Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Jayavadanapura. And uh, Sajid is actually the Honorary Secretary of SLMA. Sajit will be uh, doing an interesting uh, presentation. He will be doing a human anatomy picture quiz. Over to you, Sajit. Thank you, madam. So uh, I'll be basically uh, doing a small quiz. Actually, I want uh, to take you all to the undergraduate level. Uh, these questions are uh, basically we are covering the genetics, the gross anatomy, and the embryology also. So basically, uh, I'll be posting some questions. Uh, those are not that much difficult. 
So if you all are interested, you all can uh, either type in the chat box or you can take your phones out and you can type your answers because after that I'll be discussing the uh, questions. So the questions are given here. So the first one uh, we are asking about the type of inheritance uh, shown in this pedigree chart. First, we'll go through the questions and then we'll have a discussion. The second one, again a pedigree chart. Again, we are asking about the inheritance. The third one, this is a lateral neck X-ray uh, of a 70 year old male. So we are asking about the clinical presentation of this X-ray, most probable clinical, present, clinical condition. Hope the X-ray is clear for you all. The next one, we're asking about the clinical condition. The next question, there's a X-ray of a child uh, who comes for the clinic uh, with a knee pain. Most of these images are taken from the internet. So, and some of are uh, from our own museum. Right now, this is a karyotyping, so very simple one. So we are asking about the clinical condition shown by the karyotype. So the next one is also about a karyotype. Now we'll move on to the cross anatomy. So what is the structure lying on the probe? This is the probe. The same structure is lying on this part also.
again another one what is the structure indicated by the probe the probe is somewhere here label as number c let us see so this is a cross section These images are from our own uh, gross anatomy specimens from Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Jardanpur. Yeah, the next one. We're asking about this structure, which is lying on the pin. To help you all, uh, since you all can't see the full image, it is just we have removed the skull cap, the vault, and we have removed the brain, and we have removed the, the roof of the orbit. Okay, so this is your anterior cranial fossa. So we have removed the orbit. Okay, about this one. So what is the clinical condition uh, shown by the photograph A and B? It's not from the same patient. The two hands uh, belong to two patients. Okay, this one. So what are the deformities shown in these photographs? And what would be the most likely clinical condition? A and B. This one, the deformity shown in the photograph. This one, most likely cause of this clinical presentation. These images are from our museum, Jawadhanpura. So the clinical condition. Again, the clinical condition. Again, from our museum at Jawadalpura.
may come for the last spot. So the type of umbilical cord insertion. Okay. Hope you all have uh, have your answers with you all. So we'll start the discussion. Right. So this pedigree charts uh, looks like a little bit difficult when you see it alone, but if you know the tricks in identifying this, in 10 seconds you can identify this. Uh, so the tricky point is just to identify whether there is a skipping of the generations. So these are just uh, mental in inheritance, the single gene disorders that we are asking in the pedigrees. So here we look at first, we are looking at whether there is a skipping of the generations. So as you can see, there's all these generations are affected. So there's no skipping. So if there is a skipping, we go for recessives. If there is no uh, skipping, we come for dominant. So obviously now is going to be a dominant one. And the other, the most important trick to identify is whether just to see in parallel uh, generations, just to see male to male transmission. If there is a male to male transmission, it is an autosomal one. So just check whether it's a there's a male to male transmission. So if there is a male to male transmission, so it's going to be an autosomal dominant. Right? So in 10 seconds, you can identify just as you see the pedigree, just check whether uh, there is a skipping. If there's no skipping, it's dominant. Just check whether it's a male to male transmission. If not, uh, no male to male transmission, that means it's a X linked. If there is a male to male transmission, that is autosomal. That's a trick. So we don't have to spend hours and hours to identify this. In 10 seconds, you have your answer. So these are just uh, some examples of autosomal dominant. Right. <clears throat> we come for the next one. So uh, this is a very ca uh, cardinal pedigree uh, where uh, you can see the female is transmitting the disease to all its sons and daughters. The female is transmitting the disease to the next generation, but the male is not going to transmit the disease to the next generation. You all can see here. There's no transmission, no transmission, and no transmission. The female, when you have the disease, it's going to transmit to all the members of the next generation. So this is a cardinal feature of the mitochondrial inheritance, where we have all these inborn errors of metabolisms uh, in different formats of severity, mild, moderate, or severe formats, we have this uh, transmission. So this is, uh, mother is going to transmit and males are not going to transmit the disease. So it's mitochondrial inheritance. Right, now when you look at uh, this, you can very clearly see the lateral next extreme, uh, the narrowing of the, the spaces, disc spaces, and we have the osteophytes and there's small dearrangements. So it's a cardinal feature uh, of a spondylosis, cervical uh, spinal spondylosis. Right, so we ask about the clinical condition. So first of all, need to identify this is a CT thorax and we have the bony view uh, and this is spectus excavator. So where we have the inverge Invert the bulging of the anterior chest wall. So this highline index, uh, this is how we calculate the highline index, but usually we don't go for this. So the usual, the normal one is less than, the index should be less than two or uh, less than two. So, but higher the uh, index, we have the greater the deformity. 
right now this is the child i told is a child with an e pain so here the fusion has not occurred that is why i told this child one the physical fusion and here we have the deformity or stephanoma one of the commonest uh, benign growths of the bones so here the femur is there the tibia and the fibula here so and you can clearly see there's a fracture here so this could be the cause for the knee pain right when we come for the karyotyping it is not rocket science to identify this so i will tell another secret how to identify this in few seconds uh, now we have 23 pairs of chromosomes and here these are up to 22 from what number 1 to number 2 22 autosomes and here we have the sex chromosomes either xy or xx so when you see a karyotype first okay first uh, either it can be a problem with your because for the undergraduate exams we are not going to give hi fi stuff okay so just go by your basics so first thing uh, 50% of your problem will be solved if you first look at your uh this thing and the sex chromosomes just check whether whether xy is there or xx is there or something else if you find this uh any anomaly here so we have xx and y the client filters so your answer is there so 50% in 5 seconds you can identify this pedigree uh chart right so the others if you if you don't find anything here or xx or xy just go by from 1 uh to 22 with the uh, there are uh, pairs on each other so if we are having trisomies the 21 trisomies in downs we have three here uh edwards we have uh, 18 the three pairs here so likewise it's very easy the trick is just first look at the sex chromosomes so if you find the answer uh, your problem is solved 50% so this is client filters again very clearly you can see first look at your sex chromosomes so we have the x and the other fellow is missing so we have the x not the turners right we'll come for the gross anatomy now it's a very clear cut spot of the ulna nerve you can see on the ulna side the medial side of upper limb so it is not going in the carpal tunnel we have a separate ulna tunnel here so we have removed the, that part and you can see very clearly it supplied the small muscles of the hand okay so now this is if you fail to identify very easy these are your ribs that we have cut or you can clearly see and here you can see the clavicle the cut section of the clavicle and i don't know whether you are see it properly uh here we have a t like bony prominence that is your scapula we have the, here here we have the spine of the scapula so it's obvious infraspinatus supraspinatus subscapularis so we have asked about the supraspinatus very easy very easy to identify very easy to orientate if you get a cross section just here we have the clavicle the ribs the movement of the ribs the forward direction the downward forward direction so we have asked about the supraspinatus muscle this one is again another very easy spot that we will ask uh the largest nerve of the ophthalmic division the front row so here we have the ulna claw and here we have the ulna paradox because it the simply the difference is the in when you have the lesion at the elbow uh we lose the flexor digitorum profundus long tendons as well as the intrinsic muscles here we have the uh intrinsic muscles are gone but uh, we have the flexor digitorum profundus tendon intact 
because when you have the lesion at the wrist. So it's the, that is why we call as the ulnar paradox. This one. So here on the right side, uh, there is a underdeveloped or missing pectoral muscles. And also there are short fingers when you compare. So it's Poland syndrome. This one, clear cut diagnosis, coloboma. So this is just uh, when you are examining a patient at OPD, in, even in the genetic clinic, it's just a matter of uh, uh, flashing a light on the eye and see whether there is a coloboma because these conditions, <clears throat> there are genetic conditions associated with renal disease with these colobomas. So make sure you don't miss this. So these things can be associated with defects in the retina as well as the optic nerve. This one, the absence of your clavicle. So that is why you can bring the upper limbs closer together. Uh, so this, this is because of the absence of the clavicles. Bilateral here, when you see the X-ray, there are no clavicles. So here we have the cystic hygroma. Dr. Sitar explained this during her lecture. And carefully, unfortunately, this child, the placenta is also attached to this brain defect. And carefully. And here we have the filamentous type of or the membranous insertions, where the these vessels run in the membrane and then form the umbilical cord. So in this filamentous type, uh, there is a possibility of rupturing these vessels and during the antenatal period, there's a possibility of bleeding. So that is why this is important. Thank you. Uh, very, uh interesting presentation. I think it would have been very useful for all the medical students and those who are studying anatomy and genetics. Now the session is open for discussion. If you have any questions, you can either type in or raise a hand. in the absence of any questions, I would again like to thank all three speakers who have taken their time to prepare those interesting presentations. And before we conclude, I would also like to thank the audience who participated online. And I would like to request those who join online, if you're already not a member of SLMA, please make it a point to become a member. The junior doctors or medical students, uh, the you can become, uh, you can obtain membership either by visiting the SLMA office and uh, getting a form filled, or you can log into the web page and uh, you can uh, get your membership online by paying a fee. For the medical students, it's a monthly 500 rupees annually, sorry, not uh, monthly, it's annually, uh, which you can renew. A life membership is 10,000, and we also have a category called ordinary membership, which is 2,500 per year. So we have come to the conclude we have come to the end of this session.